So yeah, we are very happy to have uh, Mr. Uh, Dion Leinhouts, David Blankley, and Criseldo Castellan from GEA, uh, GEA, who will be speaking us today, uh, speaking to us today about cold chain technology in the Philippines and some of the best practices and uh, safety uh, that deal with these systems. Uh, so Dion, uh, I believe you are going up first. Uh, whenever you're ready, please yep. take it away. Okay, sure. Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Dion Leenhouts and I'm working for the GEA uh, Refrigeration Division as a sales consultant for uh, refrigeration installations and heat pump systems. Um, today I would like to share uh, with you our experience uh, on what's going on in the, in the, in the global cold chain uh, industry. And the goal is to show you what the developments in this industry are and what the future considerations are in terms of energy consumption and CO2 emission reduction, uh, in other words, the cold chain. So let's look at uh, what we're going to look at today. So first, I want to quick discuss quickly what are the, 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 the global industry trends uh, and what the market is saying and, 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 and what, what are they expecting from us uh, for their business and, uh, what does, and what it means for us to design a refrigeration system. Yeah, we have to take all these, 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 these future considerations into account. Uh, then we are going to look at the yeah at the mo at the importance of the rising energy and operating costs which are going on all over the world, especially with the new legislation what what will come to us. And then we're going to look at the heat loads because there it all starts. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's the quick win to to uh, to design a very efficient installation. Now now let's also see what the heart of the installation, which are the compressors what impact they have on the operating costs. And further, I would like to show you what it all means for the air and distrib temperature distribution inside the cold store. Uh, because these cold stores are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and air and temperature, te uh, temperature distribution gets more complicated. Then I would like to have a, a quick look at, uh, at uh, what we uh, normally encounter uh, in, in terms of design on, on natural refrigerants, and that can be uh, ammonia and CO2. And then I would like to have uh, some uh, final words on the CO2 emission. So what does the industry say? Cold, lane, cold chain logistics and refrigerated warehouses, they are growing. They're getting bigger, and that is because more people are uh, want to, uh, to to have high quality food products. Uh, secondly, and to stay competitive for all these uh, these customers, they have to look for lo uh, logistic solutions where they uh, reduce energy and minimize costs. And nowadays, the automatic warehouse offer the best advantages. Completely full automatic warehouses. And they are called the ASRS system, the so-called automatic storage and retrieval systems. And they grew, and the market is growing and growing every year all over the world, and especially in Southeast Asia. And the automatic high bay coal stores are the future uh, in in cold chain uh, logistics. So we, as a as a company that is designing refrigeration installations and perhaps heat pumps for them have to take these kind of things into account. So what does that mean for us? So in, in any way, it's changing. Customers would like to have 100% tracking and traceability, uh, not only for legal uh, uh, purposes, but also uh, to, to satisfy their customers. And we, things like that have to can be included in our software. There is a tremendous focus on energy consumption and everything uh, focuses uh, towards high base at the moment. And quickly, what is a high bay? You see a little, you see a little picture of one being built there. They are around 40 meters high, 100 to 150 meters long, and uh, 60 meters wide or so. They're quite, quite high and big, and fully automatic. 
Yeah, the point is, because of these high buildings, the air distribution is getting more and more difficult. Yeah, you have to get all the air nicely distributed in these high base. And uh, therefore, we developed, or there are CFD calculations and simulations that can improve this uh, air distribution and where we can reduce the energy consumption. By the way, a CFD is a computational fluid dynamics. It's a, it's a simulation tool where we can predict what the temperature and air distribution throughout the high bay uh, is going to be. Very handy. So what these, now you see here on the left, you see there this, this big crane. And uh, that is what an ASRS system yeah, generally looks uh, is, is looking like. It's a big crane or crane, some maybe four or five in one room going up and down and uh, from back and forth all the time. And therefore it has a, an impact on our air distribution, but also on our heat loads. Uh, so the heat load calculation should be taking these big cranes into account. And in terms of energy consumption, we have to have a very narrow balancing act between the evaporation temperature of the coolers and the compressors. And sometimes this air distribution system sometimes require a specific solution. Now, what, are the, what do we now take into account when we're going to design a, a plant like that? First of, first of all, it's the personal and the product safety. Uh, the, uh, that's, that's, that's the most important. Uh, what kind of natural refrigerants are we going to use? Are we going to use NH3 or CO2? It depends on all kinds of preferences. The other thing is of course HACCP and product quality. Everything has to be trackable, measurable and traceable. And for that we need a very good operator training, which we come back on later on. One of my colleagues are, is going to talk about that more. The other thing, and it's mentioned a couple of times uh, this morning, uh, operating costs, OPEX and total cost of ownership. Yeah, we wanna have high efficient uh, compressors, especially in part load because part load when installations are running in part load because the heat load is not calculated very well uh, the compressors are not really uh, none of them is, is is not they are not running fully uh, efficient in part load normally yeah then of course the right cooler selection and air distribution system and we need to discuss what are the tariffs for electricity do you have a difference in night and day because this information also has a big impact on our heat load calculation for instance we could uh, advise a customer to invest more in bigger compressors but that they are running less you know, and that they are running only in low tariff times for instance oh. so yeah, you've probably seen this picture before, but it is a very important one. Most of the costs customers are paying is not for the refrigeration installation of our compressors or whatever. It's what beneath what is beneath the surface. It's the energy. Yeah, the, the investments is only a small part uh, compared to the complete total cost of ownership. Now, the last thing, of course, and that is uh, also very important is what kind of reliability do we need? If, uh, if, if, if a customer has for $50 million worth of goods in his high bay uh, cold store, we want to make sure that nothing going to happen with, this, uh, with these products. So what about spare parts? How do we have spare parts around? Do we have a local organization that can help us if, if, if something, some uh, something happens or something needs to be serviced? All these new design criteria are specified on this, uh, the new trends in the high base. Now, let's look at the operating and energy costs for a moment. This is a very interesting uh, little graph that says what are we all paying for? What is the customer paying for? What is an operator of a manufacturing plant uh, paying for? Except for the raw materials, of course, because that's his, uh, his business. 
but he pays much the, the the biggest costs are the energy and the utility costs and the energy and utility costs one of them is of course the refrigeration installation and it's not the smallest if we look at it we have some different uh, industry sectors here that's uh, that 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 indicates how much of the electricity is used for refrigeration and it goes up from 25 percent to 85 percent for cold storage yeah the big cold storage most of the costs are for the uh, for the refrigeration installation and the electricity costs so we have a responsibility to bring these costs down now so first we're going to look where are these costs located now then we start then of course with the heat loads because there it all starts with uh as you can see two parts of heat loads are important so that is the transmission there's nothing much we can do about it uh, because uh, yeah it's dependent on the climate and the way it is insulated how the building is built and everything another big one are the product loads do we have a very smart logistic system is something you can discuss it's not wise to bring temperatures of products down in a very very big cold store it's much more efficient to get the product already on a good temperature uh, in the freezers it's much more efficient instead of doing it in a cold store so we like uh, we would like to advise that uh, you bring your uh, your goods in uh, at the storage temperature and you see two other things that is here the additional load and fan load the additional load uh, those are the big cranes and conveyor belts and and robots and all that kind of stuff that's driving and and moving around in these uh, uh, in these cold stores and then of course the fan load that those are the big coolers we're talking about big coolers here because one cooler could be approximately 300 to 400 kilowatts and give a lot of uh, and give a, a lot of uh, fan load so what are we going to do with these high with these heat loads then so first of all we need to calculate the right load but the right load is very, very subjective so we have we have to look at part loads depending on transmission well we're here in southeast asia and the climatic uh, conditions are not changing that much there's not much of a summer and winter um, condition in in uh, in the philippines product type and intake temperature yeah what is the intake temperature yeah try to get that done in a way that it's uh, uh, brought on 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 a lowest temperature as possible in an efficient way what are how many cranes and what kind of cranes are going to be installed and how many conveyor belts and how are they running and la and, uh, and what's also an interesting one to look at is the operating time of the compressors the less the copper the compressors are running the bigger they're gonna be so but that could be a good solution as i said earlier that if you, if there is a big difference in the in the tariffs let them run at the, the 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 cheapest time of the day but make them a little bit bigger but that's an investment you need to make and it needs some calculation to find out if it pays back now what are these uh, uh, because we're talking about electrical costs and operating costs what are the the main consumers well of course uh that that's uh, typical the compressors and uh in a high bay situation we call them a high bay these high rise uh, uh, logistic centers the compressors are by far the biggest condensers not that much but the, the air coolers they also are much higher than you would expect uh, big air coolers lots of air uh lots of fans let's say uh, let's say uh, for uh, for one of the cooler like this you have uh, a couple of fans they are 7.5 kilowatt each so you are easily 
on an average one, you are looking at uh, between 150 kilowatts and 200 kilowatts of electrical power of all the coolers in a high bay. So that's quite significant if you look at it on a yearly basis. Now, what can we do on these compressors? First of all, it's balancing the evaporation temperature between the coolers and the compressors. Do we invest in cheap coolers, smaller coolers, but then we have to bring the evaporation temperature down, and that means bigger compressors. The other way around, if we have big, big coolers, yeah, then we uh, could use uh, smaller compressors. So it's, it's, it's a, a balancing act. Uh, as I said before, what times of the day the compressors can run, and, of, and certainly is a smart su uh, sequence and cap capacity control system. And uh, uh, we have uh, some some nice uh, uh, solutions for that. And David's gonna, my colleague is gonna talk a, a little bit or point them out, because we need to have, to, we need to have to prevent to have compressors run in part load because part load is making the compressors a little bit uh, inefficient. And what are we going to select? Are we going to use screw compressors? for big installations. Yeah, we're looking at uh, an installation uh, typically uh, uh, between 1500 and 3000 kilowatts. Or do we need a nice combination between piston compressors and screw compressors? What's done here in Europe a lot is a floating condenser pressure. But yeah, in the Philippines, that's not going to bring a lot. Oh, wait a minute. my. That was what happened here. Sorry. Yeah, Tian, uh, no, we're, yeah. Uh, we're we're taking a look. Yeah, it looks like you got the yeah the correct slide. I think it was on the slide before. So yeah, yeah, we we have you yeah, on the I'm compressors. Here now. I'm, I'm at the right slide at the moment. I think. Yeah. Okay. I can yeah, continue, but it. Yeah. So uh, floating condenser pressure is not the best solution for the Philippines, I think, because there is not enough difference between. Uh, the summer and winter and night and day. It's uh, hot in the morning, hot in the evening, hot in the spring, hot in the in the winter. Uh, in contrast, uh, in yeah, not in Europe. There is a much bigger difference, and we can make better use of that. Yeah, and of course, regular and proactive maintenance. Not waiting until something is broken or waiting until something is not running as it should be, but be proactive. And there is software for that to keep a close eye on that. And then you will keep your compressors, uh, let's say, up to date. And look at the prices of the, of the power consumption of the compressor. Yeah, that by far the biggest, the biggest one. And we're looking, we're looking at quite some numbers on, a, on, a, on not such a big compressor, what it is costing in five years. Yeah, you're paying easily uh, half a million uh, euros or dollars for uh, for uh, uh, for a, uh, uh, an average compressor in, in five years, so it's really good to have a look at that. Yeah, so uh, and a few words on air distribution and product safety. As I mentioned, traditionally, yeah, we have these nice coolers hanging here on top of the of the cold store and blowing over the product. And what you see then. It, it that it that it could work yeah but now they're going to get bigger and longer let's say the maximum air throw of a, of a cooler is around 70 meters uh, 60 meters depends on the cooler uh, supplier but when you go to 150 meters you get this kind of effects as you can see uh, on the right bottom you see these uh, secondary flows going on in your in your cold store and what's going to happen is uh, nicely shown here in a CFD calculation is that you're going to get a quite a big temperature difference throughout the room it's very nice to see that in a simulation and maybe it's not such a big deal but you want to you just uh, go deeper in evaporation temperature ex and, and use then an extra energy to get all the temperatures within the range but it's not the perfect solution yeah so 
the air throw of the fence yeah, have to be so much that they have to reach the other side of the room, preferably. So that's a lot of power. Yeah? And there are barriers and all kinds of other stuff. Uh, let's say that that is let that is uh, uh, let's say uh, causing a, a not a very nice flow of 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 the air. So yeah, so if these these stores become big and they become bigger, they be, they really become bigger, then they need high speed fans with high driving power. So another nice solution would be. Uh, to have uh, today I heard the word already it's the cold lake principle where we go down but with a but with a low fan speed and with a low external pressure of the fence we bring it down and then we go up through the through the through the products but it's very good to simulate that to determine what would be the uh, frequency of the fence there because we do not want to overdo it, and we want to make it the the, 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 the the fan speed as low as possible. And for that, we are using the CFD calculations to make sure to the customer that all the temperatures in this room are within the range. Um, so that is uh, it's a very nice system to uh, to to make to to with a relatively low. Uh, 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 temperature uh, uh, absorbed power of the fans and have a nice uh, even distribution of temperatures here. Of course, it's not always possible to do that. Yeah, your uh, cold store needs to be uh, uh, needs to be suitable for that. Yeah, you need to be able to have a free downflow of air. We are now at one end and we are looking up and we see here the fans of the coolers blowing down. That has to be completely free, and the air must flow nicely uh, uh, and not to be disturbed by the stacking cranes. And we need some free space under the pallets, like you see here, on the on the right uh, on the right one. So we need to make the, the also during the the construction of the of the high bay, you need to take that into account that that is a free flow of air. Now. If we're going to do that nicely with the CFD modeling system, yeah, we can absolutely make it uh, uh, minimize the fan speed, and we can reduce uh, fan power. Yeah, and we and we and as I said, we use the CFD modeling, and you see more and more customers falling back on this system to make sure their air flows and air distribution in their big stores is perfect. Now, there, what we normally use uh, on, 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 on these concepts, so we have the coolers looked at, we have the compressors looked at. Uh, look at the, well, let's look at the whole thing at the moment, uh, basic concepts. We have here the basic NH3 system. It's a pump system. It's not with direct expansion, but it's still a pump system. Yeah, that's always the safest solution there is. It's the cheapest solution. It's the safest solution. Uh, in, in terms of uh, it's simple, uh, reliable, energy efficient. However, there are circumstances that customers uh, are not so happy with the amount of ammonia in it. Uh, there is quite, there can be quite a lot of ammonia in it. And of course, with the DX systems that could be reduced, but yeah, sometimes they don't want to have any ammonia or not ammonia in the, in the cold store itself. So then we have to look to another system, and that's here what we all. This is a very safe uh, and, and 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 robust system. CO2 working as an evaporating brine. It gets a little bit more complicated because you have some extra condensers and cascade condensers here. It's a, it's a bit more expensive, but here you will have only ammonia compressors in the machine room. Yeah, with uh, uh, with uh, underneath a pump system here that pumps CO2 to the coolers and it returns back again. And the last bit we use uh, a lot are the CO2 and NH3 compressors, a so-called cascade system. 
uh, they work in cascades. So you have two types of compressors here, CO2 compressors, and these are subcritical, so not transcritical, but subcritical, and high stage uh, compressors uh, that act actually as a, as a condenser for these uh, subcritical uh, condenser. Uh, so these are basic concepts, of course, and they are going to be every single uh, distribution center we're going to look at. We're going to look at what is the best. You have to look on what is the best solution because every story is different again. Now, and some last words, because it's not only about energy consumption and it's not only about uh, reducing uh, operating costs. Um, it's not only that awareness we need, but it's also about reducing the CO2 uh, emissions. As we know, in 19, uh, 2019, um, most of us signed the Paris Climate Agreement, and we have some ambitious goals to bring down the CO2 emissions. So we have to think on uh, reducing these, uh, these energy uh, consumption. Or to 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 yeah to reduce the energy consumption, based on this uh, Paris uh, Agreement, and also the Philippines has signed, and also has some ambitious uh, goals for that. So not only that, we could expect in the future uh, rising energy tariffs and CO2 taxes. That's gonna be happening in the future. So investments based on a. Uh, the total cost of ownership are getting more and more and more important. Well, thank you for listening. Dion, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. It was very, very enlightening, especially when you're talking about the automatic storage and retrieval systems, which we know are becoming popular. Um, and yep. many of them are being built uh, today in the Philippines and yep. also the use of natural refrigerants and, and why it's important. Um, but we also would like to introduce now um, your colleague, David. Uh, well, you're based in the Netherlands. He's based in, uh, in Lisbon, Portugal. So we'd like yeah. to see if, uh, if David is on right now as well, who is going to be speaking about Gaia's uh, Omni technology, I believe is uh, control, control software. Uh, David, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm here to talk about, and, and really on, on the back of uh, Dion's excellent presentation, where it's reinforced, in fact, that we need to have um, efficient equipment and very efficient design. And uh, in addition to that, we really need to have a very efficient control system. And at Gaia, we've developed a uh, controller called Omni, um, it began its life really as a compressor controller, but we have continued that development really to enhance it. So it is becoming more and more a system controller. And the basis for Omni was really efficiency, that is driving the compressors in the most efficient way, but also communication because nowadays we have um, so many ways to communicate with, with internet and Wi-Fi and our mobile phones. So we have embraced that technology and incorporated it in our Omni controller. So for instance, a quick customer report. So here's a control system. Here's our Omni controller. Could be mounted on one of our compressor packages. It comes with a QR code where it's possible to scan on your mobile phone. And that would give you instantly the operating conditions on that machine. So you only have to have a Wi-Fi connection to be able to see how your compressors are operating and even by your mobile phone. But Omni is more than that in terms of the compressor. It's really looking at um, giving customers peace of mind. So also lowering things like maintenance costs. So we look at features like automatic maintenance alerts, dynamic maintenance, which means we're constantly looking at the operation of the compressor over a period of time to see if there are any small changes that are occurring that might need some attention. It's very configurable. 
so the customer can actually see the data that he wants to look at and there is everything available within the omni control as to what's happening on your compressor and paperless reports so consequently if we need a service report or we want to check when the last service was done or um, see what the the engineer actually found if you made any notes that can all be stored on the omni controller and network communication as i mentioned communication in this modern day and age is so easy but also we recognize that customers also have their own protocols sometimes so we built into the Gaia omni some standard communication features so if you're using modbus or ethernet or modbus rtu or you have an Allen bradley plc which is controlling your plant omni can communicate with it and we have other options as well, like Profibus or Profinet. So we try and cover the spectrum of communication uh, modules that are, are current in the world today. We have other features like OmniLink. So really, Omni is fully accessible anywhere you have a Wi-Fi connection. And OmniLink allows the operator to make changes from remote locations. So he can direct data um, to his computer. He can upload files, for instance. He can make automatic backups. And he can update the program and configuration. So as Dion described in the store, maybe we have um, a, a change of product and we can wish to change the evaporating temperature in the store to more suit the product. That can be done completely remotely via the OmniLink method. Omni also incorporates this key driver, which is efficiency. So we developed a smart sequencer. And Dion also mentioned what type of compressor you're using. Well, Sometimes it can be a combination, screw compressors and a piston compressor working on the same system. That piston compressor can be um, there for things like weekend duty. Very often when the store is not operating at weekend, then why run a big screw compressor set with a very large motor when you can do that duty with as much smaller machine? And the smart sequencer also looks at the size of the compressors as I mentioned, and it will balance those machines to give the most efficient operation at any given moment in time. So if we see the opportunity to switch a, a large drive motor off, replace it with a smaller machine or a smaller drive motor, then Omni will automatically do that for you in the smart sequencer. The same goes for chillers instance this um this shows three ch chillers they can be of different sizes it can be chilling glycol um we have a buffer tank for the control and in this sequence again we're looking at maximizing the efficiency so we have compressors that go below 50 percent capacity for instance then we can decide to turn them off we can decide to uh, increase compressor speeds to give the best combination at any one time to suit the actual conditions in the plant and the actual duty that's required. It's live and it's dynamic. I mentioned Gaia is more than a compressor controller, so we can add um, the Omni as a system panel, whereby we can connect all the compressors and we can start to connect other features of the plant, so pumps condensers and even air coolers and we do that by a feature called the smart connection box so on each of these individual components we have smart connection box which takes in data and delivers that to the omni system panel and we're already working on algorithms to enable artificial intelligence to be included in the Omni. It's already there in to some degree, but this is really a, a, 
an opportunity to have real-time anomaly detection. So as soon as we think that something might be happening within the plant that we see as a small abnormality, then that can automatically be detected and automatically be um, delivered to the service organization and the operator at the same time. Uh, we live in a digital world and uh, we're uh, encompassing all those features and, and, um, uh, and, and things that can really help us um, develop further this control system to give you the optimum control. Thank you for listening. David, David, thank you very much uh, for that. You know, Gaia is uh, supplying not just uh, compressors and, and systems for industrial refrigeration, but it's good to know and learn about the advancements that you're making in control systems as well and, and taking advantage of, of everything that you can do today with, uh, with data and anal analytics to increase the efficiency <laughs> and maintenance as well. Uh, so thank you again, David. Thank you. So now uh, we are going to be connecting with uh, Criseldo uh, from the Philippines, actually, from Gaia, Filipinas. Uh, Criseldo, can you hear me? Yes, uh, Devin. Can you hear me also? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, you're good to go. You're going to be telling us a little bit uh, from your perspective about uh, ammonia safety and best practices. So uh, please go ahead. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, uh, David and David also. So I will be good afternoon and good morning to everyone. I will be sharing with you uh, based from experience and some international and local codes about the ammonia safety and best practices. Okay, so it is important for people handling ammonia to familiarize and understand how the system works. Uh, training of people handling the plant should be made aware of the probable hazards and how to treat it. Uh, safety training should be done prior to handover of the plant. It is advised that an annual training be conducted to personnel handling the plant. Uh, this will serve as a refresher to the system operation and maintenance. Also, should there be incoming new employees, training should commence as soon as onboarded. Would there be any activities, for example, such as repairs, or installation works, safety guidelines must be discussed both with uh, the client or the representative and the contractor. Okay, ammonia machine room. Uh, refrigeration, ammonia re machine room, uh, machinery rooms must be constructed in accordance with the building code intended for ammonia system applications. Uh, signages as well as other pertinent information should be visible. And also authorized personnel are allowed should they be entering the machine room. Okay, pipe marking. Uh, pipe marking should be installed for accurate identification for flow. Uh, this is also to distinguish the type of medium present in the pipe as well as its characteristics. The physical state, uh, liquid or, or gas, uh, the relative pressure, whether if it's for high pressure or low pressure. Uh, the pipe service, for example, if it's for the hot gas line, suction line or condensate line and also the directional flow. Okay, bulb tagging is also included. Uh, it should be installed also for proper identification and for locating it easier. This should as well be in alignment with the uh, PNID, piping and instrumentation diagram for accuracy. So you can vet, 
you can easy locate easily locate the valves that you will be doing some activities on okay uh, for this slide it shows the information of the equipment the set points for the alarm and also records of past faults should be kept so it's sort of a history should there be some activities done to an equipment uh, be recorded and then also what actions what uh, solutions have been made to it monitoring should be done to ensure that equipments on the plant are on the permissible operating conditions so the settings Okay, ammonia pressure vessel. Uh, ammonia pressure vessel should comply uh, with the ASME pressure and vessel code, section eight, division one. Uh, this covers the design, fabrication, inspection and testing uh, during construction of uh, the pressure vessel. Uh, manufacturers producing pressure vessel shall provide data affixed on the nameplate. Also, this, the pressure vessels should have the uh, safety features such as uh, relief bulb installed. So it should be sealed and set by the manufacturer. And also of the approved type and capacities. So if it's for a low, low pressure side or for it, it's uh, for the high pressure side. Also, uh, some local guides required uh, permit Normally here it's uh, for an annual, so uh, no per should be uh, pressure vessel should be only uh, used uh, with uh, permit approved permit. Also, the permit should be displayed in a conspicuous location, so easily seen, so that they know or people know by inspection that the vessel is still good to use. At least uh, one ammonia detector uh, for uh, best practice uh, shall be provided in the room or area. Alarms shall be activated whenever the refrigerant vapor exceeded the permissible exposure limit. So normally for people it's around 50 ppm. Uh, audible and visual alarm shall be provided inside the room to warn that when the alarm has activated. Access to the room is restricted to authorized and emergency responders only. In uh, connection with the leak detector, purge fans shall also respond automatically to the refrigerant concentration detection system. Okay. Availability of personal protective equipment should be at site. Uh, an ammonia suit, chemical resistant uh, apron, cell cutting braiding app apparatus or SCBA, SCABA, uh, full face chemical mask and chemical gloves. Um, we would recommend, uh, suggest, uh, depending actually on the size of the, the plant, but a minimum of two units of uh, of uh, SCABA or SCBA and uh, full of face mask. And also during activities, uh, we recommend of uh, two person, a body body system, should there be any handling activities for ammonia. Okay. Approved and safe methods. So prior to any activity, risk assessment and methodology are discussed by the plant authorized personnel and contractor uh, to ensure safe and timely accomplishment of work. Uh, work permits should be secured and coordination of other parties involved, such as management and production. We encourage uh, that toolbox meeting sh uh, should always be exercised.
Okay. So this slide, familiarity of the plant site. Okay. So if you have some activities being done at the the plant, you should uh, uh, know your location and the evacuation area. Also be aware of the safe route should an emergency happen or occur. Okay, so for this slide, all equipment shall be located in such a manner as to allow enough space to exit in an event of emergency. Emergency uh, exits must be clearly marked and illuminated. No obstruction should be located in these exits. Also, uh, based from the code, machinery room shall be equipped with light fixtures uh, delivering a minimum of 320 lumens per square meter. Okay. Another best practice is uh, each machinery rooms shall have uh, access to a minimum of two eye wash or safety shower units. Establishment of an emergency response team should an ammonia-related accident occur. So they should have a response plan, first aid, and people with assigned tasks should the emergency happen. Okay. Um, accidental uh, release. Uh, so, should this happen, accidental precautionary measures are done. Use of PPEs, water dispersion, location of the source of leak and isolating it. Uh, also, uh, accounting of persons at the plant once at the evacuation site. And then, activation of the emergency response team. So, this happens should there be uh, an accidental release. Okay, handling. Uh, refrigerants and refrigeration oil uh, not charged within the system shall be stored in a secured and ventilated area. Also, you should have the right trolley to be used. And uh, disposal, drains, overflows, and blowdown provisions shall have an indirect connection to an approved disposal location. Discharge of chemical waste uh, shall be approved by the regulatory or by the plant uh, safety uh, guidelines. Okay. Okay. Um, associated with safety is uh, the maintenance. Um, it's a process uh, to keep equipment, tools, as well as instruments uh, in a reliable working order. Well, main objectives are to avoid being inoperable or should an emergency breakdown uh, occur, make repairs. So importance of maintenance is being stressed, uh, stressed out to reduce breakdowns, increase uptime, and promote overall reliability, and also to avoid disruption of production time. Okay, so generally, we have two types of maintenance. Uh, one is corrective and one is preventive. Corrective means uh, the activity which are carried out after the occurrence of uh, failures to correct the failures. Well, this can also be referred as an unscheduled or unplanned maintenance. So some samples of that are cases wherein we have experienced some flooded compressor, burnt motor, or passing of bulbs. And then preventive maintenance. Uh, meanwhile, our activities um, 
which are carried out to prevent the occurrence of failures. So these are planned, planned uh, maintenance. Uh, further classified into two, direct maintenance and monitoring. Direct maintenance are planned activities carried out to ensure uh, instrument and equipment operations are followed. So samples of this are PMS for compressors, uh, checking of alarms, checking of ventilation fans, lubrication. Next is uh, monitoring whereas by constantly checking the parameters like pressure, temperatures, and other data, major faults that are slowly developing can be detected in time. So these are some of examples of this one are visual checkup, uh, checking for unusual sounds, uh, cleaning of filter, and checking of pressures and liquid levels. So also, we can use here the uh, some SCADA or Omni to check if we are still operating in the uh, proper condition. Ready? Yeah. Well, basically that that. Uh, that's my that concludes my presentation for the safety and and maintenance. Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, Crisaldo. Thank you also to uh, Dion and David uh, from GEA for your very informative presentation. Uh, we have just run out of time, so I only have one question uh, addressed to Crisaldo about the situation on the ground in Philippines. When it comes to safety of, of use, safety use of ammonia, when it comes to training of the technicians, what is the role of the government? Is there any mandatory training that uh, the technicians need to pass in order to handle ammonia safely in Philippines? Can you please comment on that? Thank you. Okay. Um, technicians here are trained not just by the local, but, but also by international training. And also, uh, we follow the local goals, especially for the OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Hazard, here. So, uh, GAYA's initiative is to share and to align with the government and the local guides, as well as the client, that we follow the safety, uh, safety practice, best practice, to avoid any emergency during uh, uh, repairs or activities. Okay, my question was about the role of government. Is there a mandatory training that is requested by the government, by the association, for to handle ammonia in Philippines? Or is it an industry initiative? Actually, it's more of an industry initiative, uh, Jan. Okay, that, excellent. Jan. Well, hopefully we will see we will see more and more of the latest technologies and automatic controls and you know, low charge ammonia configuration, whatever they are, that will further contribute to the higher efficiency and higher safety. So thank you very much again uh, for sharing all the information today with uh, our uh, delegates. Uh, I would also like to invite you right after the event uh, in uh, about 40 minutes, we will have an informal Zoom meeting. Uh, everyone who likes to join from all our delegates, so please uh, join us as well. The link is in the resources on the uh, console. We will also share it here in the chat with all the speakers. So in about 4, 30, 36, 7 minutes, we will have an informal get together as well. So thank you. Thank you yep. to all gentlemen from Gea. Yeah.